In around 48 hours from now, the NBA will kick off its 78th NBA final series, this time between the number one seed out of the Eastern Conference, the Boston Celtics, and the five seed out of the West, the Dallas Mavericks. This is a tale of two different teams, one with the best player this postseason in Luka Doncic and a team that completely reinvented itself at the trade deadline versus a team that has been far and away the best team in the NBA all season and has a chance with a finals win to be considered one of the greatest teams in NBA history. In this video, we will discuss everything you need to know before the NBA finals. Let's dive in. First things first, we're going to discuss the matchup in the regular season post trade deadline when Dallas had the team that it has now. It occurred on March 1st, 2024, and the Celtics would blow out the Mavericks 138 to 110. Dallas would get it to just a two point deficit 81 to 79 in the third quarter but the celtics would then outscore them 21 to 11 the rest of the third and 36 to 20 in the fourth and in that game i'm not sure how much we can really learn from it just because this dallas team has continued to evolve even since then but the celtics did what they always do they shot it well from three 48.8 percent meanwhile dallas shot it awful only 26.5 percent but i think the biggest thing we can takeaway from this regular season matchup is that Luka Doncic being great isn't enough on its own versus a fantastic offense like Boston. Luka finished with 37, 12, and 11 and was efficient doing so. This game did take place before Jason Kidd put Derek Jones Jr. back into the starting lineup, which has revolutionized their defense. However, DJJ only played seven minutes in this game and the rest of the supporting cast for Dallas really did not do much. Even Kyrie was one for seven from three, nine for 23 from the field. Josh Green shot just one for five from the field. Dante Axum one for five as well. At the same time, as a Dallas fan, you could say Daniel Gafford only played six minutes in this game. Tim Hardaway Jr. played a lot. It was a regular season game. Dallas was still trying to figure out the best way to organize their new pieces. They are a much different team now than they were even just three months ago. This may come as a surprise to some of you, but a five seed has never won an NBA title. Matter of fact, the Dallas Mavericks are just the second five seed ever to make the NBA Finals, joining the 2020 Miami Heat in the bubble. But what's even crazier than that is just two teams have won an NBA championship while being lower than a three seed in the playoffs. First off, the number four seed Boston Celtics in 1969. But come on, this was the tail end of the greatest dynasty in NBA history. Not necessarily the craziest thing ever. And then the 1995 Houston Rockets, who were a six seed, but they were also the defending champs. So again, not necessarily a normal six seed. So in order for Luka and the Dallas Mavericks to get this done, they do have to make history. Taking it a step further, only five four seeds have ever made a finals, going one and four. Like I said, just two five seeds have ever made it, 0 oh and one so far. Two six seeds going one and one. A seven seed has never made it and two eight seeds have also made it the 1999 new york knicks and last year's miami heat going 0-2 just from a historical perspective the dallas mavericks have a uphill battle ahead of them but from a storyline perspective there's a lot going into these nba finals as well for one you have kyrie irving's redemption in his early 30s just five to six years removed from being a part of a two-year failed experiment with the boston celtics that he was very immature about then you also have chris tapps porzingis who was just announced he's going to be available for game one. He spent two and a half years as a Dallas Maverick. And lastly, you have the storyline of Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown, who have been to five and six Eastern Conference Finals in their career, have only broken through twice now, including this season, looking for their first title. So there's a lot going into this series. I'm super excited about it. Not to mention Luka Doncic right now looks like the best player in the world. So with all of that out of the way, let's get into to statistics, matchups, all the good stuff and figure out who is going to win this series. I'll give my prediction at the end of this video. You can take it or leave it for what it's worth. Let's get into it. Thank you to Pristine Auction for sponsoring this video. In our last video, we ended up purchasing via auctions four different items, sports memorabilia from pristineauction.com. And in this video, we are going to unbox all four of those items. 
The first one is a Nas Reed signed jersey, which we already gave away on Twitter. Shout out to Drones 3 for winning that. And the other three items that I'm about to unbox, we're going to be giving away on my Twitter as well. So go ahead and follow that now. Let's get into it and unbox these items. I'm super excited. Let's go. Look at that. <laughs> Look at that. Let's go. This Nas Reed jersey is super super sick shout out to d drones for winning it it's also graded by psa which is one of the gold standards in the industry let's open up the jade mcdaniels one next look at that i don't know if you can see the, the sign or not but right there okay so guys i'm gonna be giving away this jade mcdaniels jersey on my twitter it's going to be live for one week it'll be my pinned tweet on my profile check the link in the description shout out to pristine auction for sponsoring these giveaways and yeah come win a jade mcdaniels jersey all right let's open up the desmond bain signed jersey next this is sick okay so guys this one i got via pristine's 10 minute auctions and it was actually a very reasonable price check this out so this one i will give away after the jade mcdaniels one ends and it's signed as well. I don't know if you can see the signature there. Okay, our final item that we got from Pristine is a mystery card. There's a chance this card could be worth a lot of money. There's also a chance it's a dud, but we're gonna open it. Let's see what happens. I'll be giving this one away last on my Twitter, if it's worth anything, of course. Let's see what we got. I see that it's Falcons and it is graded by PSA. A Brett Favre rookie card. It's not signed or anything, but we got a Brett Favre rookie card. That's pretty sick. I don't know anything about cards. So if you're a card guy, let me know if this is worth anything. It's a nine out of 10 graded by PSA. And it looks like it is an upper deck star rookie card. I mean, he's sitting on the bench with a headset. So I'm not sure if that's worth anything. It looks like it's in a college jersey. So we got a Brett Favre rookie card for our fourth item again guys thank you so much to pristine auction for sponsoring these items use code hardwood 10 to get ten dollars off your first auction winner at pristineauction.com thank you so much again don't forget to follow my twitter and i highly recommend you check out pristine those 10 minute auctions are super fun they go on almost every second of the day hardwood 10 ten dollars off Let's get back into the video. Let's start with three-point shooting. The Boston Celtics were the best team in the NBA when you adjust for both frequency and accuracy from beyond the arc. In the regular season, they shot 42.5 three-point attempts per game, which was a league leader, and they were second in three-point percentage at 38.8%. They do not have a weak shooter on the floor in their eight-man rotation, which makes it really hard to leave guys open in the corner and cheat down and pack the paint something Dallas has done a lot in this postseason but because they rely on three-point shooting so much there's going to be more variance in that I was curious how much this affects them so I looked it up and if the Boston Celtics shoot just a league average 36 percent from three in a game they've gone 54 and six on the season and including the postseason this year which is absolutely insane which means when they shoot below league average below 36 percent they are just just 22 and 14. Meanwhile, when Dallas allows an opponent to shoot 36% from three or better, they are just 24 and 27. However, at the same time, Dallas is not the same team that they were earlier in the season. Matter of fact, just six days after that regular season loss to Boston on March 7th, they would rattle off a 16 and two record down the stretch, having the number one defensive rating in the entire league and the fourth ranked offense. That is way closer to what this Dallas Mavericks team actually is in the postseason than anything else in the regular season. So if we take that date into account, they've been nine and seven since March 7th when an opponent shoots greater than 36% from three. I'm just so intrigued to see how Jason Kidd decides to match up defensively and what the game plan is. Because with Boston, especially with Porzingis active, what can you do? You can't really leave three-point shooters open. Matter of fact, Drew Holiday in the regular season from the corner three shot 62%. Meanwhile, in series like the Oklahoma City Thunder and the Minnesota series, Dallas was perfectly fine with guys like Jade McDaniels, Nikhil Alexander, 
Alexander Walker, Kyle Anderson, even Lou Dort, Isaiah Joe, Josh Giddy shooting threes from the corner, and it worked out for them in large part. Some of that in the Oklahoma City Thunder series you could say was due to shot variance. However, it's worked for Dallas, and I think the Boston Celtics are the worst team to try to deploy that strategy against. I really think the key for the Celtics is going to be to just take as many good looks from three as you possibly can, especially when you consider just how good Daniel Gafford and Derek Lively have been in the paint protecting the rim this postseason. However, if you want to play devil's advocate, the Celtics should have an easier job of getting to the rim with more space than teams like the Timberwolves did, due solely to how much better spacing they'll have on the floor with that shooting. I also really think the Celtics need to punish Luka on defense in this series. The Wolves completely failed at being able to do so. So if you're a Boston fan, I think what you are thinking and the reason this series gives you so much hope is that you're saying Dallas has not faced an offense like us yet. Yes, Oklahoma City was a very good offense, very similar in terms of how much shooting they have, but they didn't shoot it well in those playoffs and they still took the Dallas Mavericks to six games. So as long as you don't have crazy bad shot variants in this series, you have to be feeling good on the offensive end. Something that the Minnesota Timberwolves, although they had a great defense, just could not rely on their offense enough. When it comes to Dallas's offense, I have to point this out. They would not be where they are right now without PJ Washington and Derek Jones Jr. shooting as well from the corner three as they have in this postseason. The thing about the Dallas offense that has been so special is that Luka demands so much attention. Having Kyrie one pass away off the ball to create when Luka gets tired is massive, but not just that, it gets taken to a whole nother level when they have a lob threat in the game at all times. Speaking of which, with these lobs, Daniel Gafford and Derek Lively have been feasting on lobs all playoffs. But then when you add that extra element of not just Kyrie one pass away being able to create a lob threat at all times in the pick and roll, but then Derek Jones Jr. and or PJ Washington sitting in the corner and waiting for a pass from Luka to hit that corner three, this Dallas offense becomes unstoppable at that point. In the regular season, PJ Washington shot just 23.9% from the corner three and took just 40% of his three-point attempts from there. Meanwhile, Derek Jones Jr. shot 58.6% of his three-point attempts from there, but shot just 34.3% from three. However, in the postseason, PJ Washington is taking 58% of his attempts from the corner, shooting a whopping 42.4% from three in the corner. And DJJ is taking almost 70% of his attempts from there, shooting a whopping 47.2%. That is a substantial improvement from both of these guys. And if you're a Dallas fan, you need them to do this in this series. It is the key that unlocks this offense to that extra tier they've been in in this postseason season, which you absolutely need playing a team like the Boston Celtics. I thought this tweet by Iztok Franco, a writer for D Magazine covering the Mavericks, and this entire thread in general, a link in the description, was incredible. Basically, he did an analysis on how the Boston Celtics lose their games, and three things come up. Number one, they shoot poorly. Number two, opponents shoot well, and they get crushed on the offensive glass. Of course, that's pretty obvious, but that's what happens when you shoot tons of threes. You get this type of variance. The Mavericks have to capitalize and win any game in this series that the Celtics shoot below their average from three. One other tweet from this thread I wanted to bring up that I thought was genius is that although Minnesota was the best defense throughout the entire regular season, probably the best defense in the NBA, they weren't the best matchup against a team like Dallas because Luka is so lethal at punishing bad off-ball defenders. I mean, just take a look at guys like Anthony Edwards and Carl Anthony Towns in this series. They get a little lackadaisical off the ball, which is absolutely crucial when stopping the lob threats that the Dallas Mavericks constantly have on the floor at all times. Minnesota's strengths were Rudy Gobert as the defensive anchor and their incredible perimeter on-ball defense, but Dallas was able to heavily exploit the off-ball defense weakness. However, I don't really see the Celtics having that type of off-ball defense problem. Let's say Jalen Brown guards Luka. That's who I think they're going to put on him. Maybe they put Drew Holiday. I just think Drew is a little too small, both in his size. He's only 6'4", and also he's only 210 pounds. It feels like to me, Luka is able to move guys like that a lot easier with his size. But let's just say for this exercise, Jalen Brown is guarding Luka. 
and Derek White is on Kyrie. With Porzingis active, that means they're probably gonna put Porzingis and Drew Holiday off ball on PJ Washington and DJJ and put Tatum on Gafford and Lively. Who knows, they may put Porzingis back on Lively or Gafford, but that's what they did in that regular season matchup on March 1st. And regardless of who it is, between Tatum, KP, and Drew Holiday, I trust those guys so much more. Those guys are smart, high IQ defenders. They're not going to commit the same off ball mistakes that Cat and Ant made. Again, I'm a Wolves fan. This is no disrespect to Minnesota, but it's facts. When it comes to coaching in this series, it's crazy to think just a few months ago, everyone was calling for Jason Kidd's head, but now we are in the NBA Finals, and for the past month, Jason Kidd has been getting praise for his adjustments in these playoffs. And I could be wrong, but I feel like he has outcoached his opponents in every single series these playoffs, besides maybe Mark Dagnalt from OKC. Dallas didn't really have to go deep into their bag of adjustments in that Western Conference Finals. So I'm super excited to see what other things they're ready to deploy, specifically on the defensive end, to deter this Boston Celtics team. And I think Jason Kidd is going to do everything he can. Meanwhile, with Joe Missoula, I do like Joe Missoula as a coach however this is his real first test in my opinion yes he coached the eastern conference finals last year versus coach spo but in my opinion this is the first real test that we get to see how deep does joe Missoula's adjustments go what is he willing to do does he have some tricks up his sleeve i don't necessarily have an opinion of who i would choose more in the head coaching matchup in this series however i'm excited to see these two coaches go at it and who knows man maybe this series is the series that Joe Missoula ascends as a head coach and we get to see everything he has to offer. At the end of the day, what this really does come down to, in my opinion, is that the Dallas Mavericks have the best player in Luka Doncic. The Boston Celtics have the best team. They've been the best team all season long. It's not their fault that their opponents got hurt. I still think they beat every single team regardless. I think for me, the thing I'm most looking forward to is to see if the Mavericks offense can continue to click the way they they have all postseason versus a completely different type of defense. In that Minnesota series, even though those games were close, it just seemed like the Dallas was able to get everything they wanted, whether it was the lobs, Luka getting to his spots, the corner threes that were wide open. I imagine they're going to have to work a lot harder on the offensive end in this series. But it's really going to come down to, in my opinion, which defense can stall the other offense just a little bit more. I think these are going to be very high scoring games. It's probably going to come down to a lot of clutch time, which probably does give the edge to Dallas in Kyrie and Luka. But my ultimate prediction for this series is the Boston Celtics in seven games. I think it's going to be a great series. I love Dallas. However, I think that guys like Derek White, Drew Holiday, Chris Stapps Porzingis are going to be so much more effective than guys like PJ Washington, Derek Jones Jr., even Gafford and Lively, who I've loved in these playoffs. And I just don't know if Luka and Kyrie have enough to be that much better than Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. Maybe they do. Maybe Jason Tatum has a horrible series, which the media will have a heyday over. But in my opinion, the Celtics just have too much to throw at you, and it's too hard to keep up unless they're shooting poorly from three. So that's my prediction for this series guys let me know what you think about these nba finals it's going to be a super fun one like i said there's a lot of different storylines going into it that i'm excited to see unfold i really do hope though we get a long series that includes a ton of adjustments a chess match if you will and again i'm really really excited to see how boston plays defense versus this dallas offense and if Dallas is able to deter the Celtics from their incredible three-point shooting. Thanks for watching this video, guys. If you enjoyed it, I did just make a video on the Boston Celtics, if they can break this streak, where we go into the history of the past seven or eight seasons, the Celtics making the Eastern Conference Finals a ton, or this video on Joel Embiid, the MVP who can't win. Again, thanks for watching. Consider subscribing, hit the notification bell, and as always, we'll see you on the hardwood.